The use of this technology hasn't been limited to broadcast television. It has led to the emergence of a new art form that takes viewers from the living room to the museum and the theater. Later in the program, we'll discuss how these developments are paving the way for an all-electronic cinema. But first, a little video magic. The wizardry that has turned Simon and Garfunkel into electronic silly putty has radically changed the look of television over the past few years. The TV picture is no longer limited by two dimensions. The device that can perform such amazing feats is called, appropriately enough, the Mirage. The principle behind this system or any other digital effects system is that the video information, and by that I mean what color is it, how bright is it, uh, where is each piece of information located physically on the screen, all of that information is converted into computer or digital information, in other words, zeros and ones. Once it's in that form, the computer, by doing a massive amount of computation, of arithmetic, can manipulate all of those parameters. And the parameters that we're most interested in manipulating are location parameters. A video picture contains thousands of tiny picture elements, or pixels, which are like the grains of a photograph. The computer translates the color, brightness, and location information about each pixel into numbers. In order to mold a flat picture into a three-dimensional one, the computer, guided by a complex program, reassigns each pixel a new location value. This process involves thousands of calculations the computer can perform in a few seconds. To create a new mirage effect, I have to look at the video screen as a piece of graph paper with 99 by 63 points. Those points each need to be assigned a place in three-dimensional space. I can assign those points by using some kind of elegant mathematics or just by moving them around because I know where they're supposed to go. Elegant mathematics drove the complex program needed to turn Cindy Lauper and friends into bubbles on this music video. The Mirage is considered a very clumsy beast to operate. It requires a programmer, somebody who is very knowledgeable in programming language and mathematics, and every day the industry tries to make this more accessible to artists. Sometime in the future, you'll be able to take an object, like your pencil or your watch, and lay it on a stand and take a laser wand or something and pass it over it, and the computer will, quote unquote, see the object and know how to describe it in computer language instantly. That's friendliness. <laughs> While the Mirage has freed the TV picture from the constraints of flatness, Charlax has freed it from the constraints of logic. The New York production company used an ingenious combination of tools to produce this home video featuring the rock group Yes. One piece of equipment Charlex depends on is the electronic paint box. It's a device, a new electronic device that allows the art director to cut, paste, airbrush, paint, stencil, all with the use of this pen. And no brushes, no scissors, no messy, messy gook. And you can operate the whole thing by operating your pen crossing certain parameters of the screen, you can call up a menu. What we've done here, here we have a menu, and by tapping any box, you pick what mode you want the machine to be in. With the paint box, Henry can alter an existing image, drastically or subtly, in a fraction of the time it would take to do so by hand. A video camera transmits a picture to the monitor, 
when Henry presses the pen against a tablet that covers a network of circuits, his brush strokes become visible on the screen. He's able to mix any color he wants and can use brush strokes of many different widths. The paint box works on the same principle as the Mirage does. In response to the artist's commands, a computer reassigns color values to the pixels making up the screen image. But the paint box can do more than just paint. In paste up mode, I have the ability to cut out any shape on the screen just by delineating a rectangle, which cuts out the shape, and I have a duplicate. Now I have two nymphs, and I can stick that down there, and I can do it again, and I have three nymphs, and stick that there, and, oh, maybe I want this one to flip, so I just hit flip, and now they're back to back. And maybe I want to tumble them, and I can tumble them like that, and you can see already how easy it is to get a uh, design going on your machine. Paintbox graphics eventually are combined with images of objects shot in the studio against a blue backdrop. A device called the Ultimat electronically separates an object from the blue field behind it so that it can be placed over a different background. The main piece of equipment I use is the uh, video switcher where it, um, it has different inputs from the paint box, from tape machines, um, from different cameras, uh, whatever that uh, you can mix together, combine the pictures together, and come up with the, fi with the final picture. Uh, like I said before, it's similar to an audio mixer where you have many different audio inputs to, to put a song together. You have, um, we have many different video pictures we put together to come out with the final picture. Bill relies on a piece of equipment known as an ADO, which stands for Ampex Digital Optics. The ADO can change the size of an image and move it like the Mirage does, but its strength is 2D rather than 3D manipulation. The same technique went into making this open to Saturday Night Live. The section featuring Billy Crystal began as a storyboard sketch. The production team selected colors to use in each area of the screen. Paintbox artists enhanced pictures of buildings taken from books, adding lights to the windows. A railroad bridge became the foreground. In the studio, a cameraman shot Billy Crystal sitting in a chair against a blue background that was later matted out. The same technique put his close-up on a TV screen. During the editing process, Bill Weber combined these images with many other background and foreground ingredients. This frame, like most of the 17 others in the sequence, contains over 30 items. To get the results technically perfect, Charlex had to overcome video's greatest liability. Unlike film editing, which involves physical cutting, videotape editing calls for transferring images from source tapes to a master tape. Anytime an image is transferred, it goes down a generation. That is, it loses quality. Hopefully digital recording, which is just beginning, will, will be su successfully introduced itself into professional um, broadcasting and editing. And once the technology um, works better and we don't have to figure out ways around all the problems, it will become more visible to us as designers and producers um, of, of this type of work so that we can just do what we want and not spend our energies trying to solve problems. Anything that I can imagine put on screen now, we can almost get there very, very quickly. Um, this for artists, and I really am not an artist by training, but the possibilities for artists from this medium are, are outrageously vast. In a recent exhibit, New York's Museum of Modern Art included this music video Charlex created for The Cars. Alongside Calders and Warhols, the museum shows the best of broadcast television, as well as experimental works not often aired on TV. You kept it going till the sun fell down. You kept it going. Networks are always competing with one another. They 
are trying to come up with new ideas, often it seems like it's repeating what's been done in the past, but they, in their search for some innovations, take a look at what the experimental artists are doing. So they look at what's going on at the Museum of Modern Art, at, at the Kitchen, um, at the Whitney Museum and its program. What Reynold Widenar does with technology is very different from what the networks are doing with it. He began working in video to bring a visual element to performances of his electronic music. Now, he composes with sounds and images. An important aspect of his work is what he calls ghost piano, a line of music that is seen but not heard. Basically what I do is I start with a, a, an idea of sound or an idea of a visual and uh, then I look for ways to amplify that and extend it and sort of create more levels of feeling uh, with, with the material. And of course technology is, a, is the tool that uh, enables me to do that. Um, I can take, uh, for example, sounds uh, recorded on audio tapes which uh, you would never hear in the final piece, but uh, I can take them and feed them into a synthesizer and I can create an electronic waveform from that, uh, which is not audible, but which can be used to control some features of the video. Kit Fitzgerald is bringing music and video together in another way with a remarkable new device called the Fairlight Computer Video Instrument. The Fairlight is a portable digital effects generator with many of the features the paint box and the ADO offer, but it sells for under $10,000, a fraction of what the others cost. Kit plays the Fairlight much as one would play a keyboard. Recently, she jammed with jazz great Max Roach at New York's La Mama Theater. Once we've gotten video to be so um, detailed and precise and perfect and clean and high tech and, and all of that, now I'm really enjoying messing it up again and getting physical with it, really. And um, that's, that's a whole new era in video I'm, that we are just approaching. One thing that really excites me about what's happening with technology is that it's getting smaller and it's getting cheaper, which means that basically it's being put into the hands of more and more people each year. Now, the, the public, the, all, the world, in fact, is gaining more control over their television sets, which has always been an impetus for me in my work to prove that television could actually be human and alive and, and breathe life into people and uh, that always seemed very humanistic and idealistic, but look, it's, it's actually happening. A new product from the Sony Corporation could put video technology into the hands of more and more people, literally. The Mini 8 makes shooting home movies as easy as taking a snapshot. This is both a camera and a recorder, but it weighs less than three pounds. Instead of a conventional pickup tube, the Mini 8 uses a light sensitive silicon chip known as a CCD. This allows you to shoot in low light. And the videotape that it uses is the width of an eight millimeter film, but two hours worth comes on a cassette the size of the kind that you'd put into a Walkman. The camera runs on a battery that lasts up to 80 minutes before it has to be recharged. And you can see what you've shot right after you've shot it on any home TV set with a compact playback deck that comes with the camera. The image quality is as good as you'd get with the more cumbersome half inch equipment. Such instant gratification can be had for just under $1,800. While Sony's Mini 8 puts the real world on tape, technology developed by another Japanese company is putting imaginary worlds on tape. Toyo Lynx is a leader in the field of computer-generated animation. The Tokyo-based company specializes in 3D graphics that move in complex ways. To accomplish this, Toyo Lynx designs and produces its own computer software and hardware. This is an excerpt from an animated short about robots on a journey through the galaxy. 
At the beginning of the story, a spaceship travels to a satellite of the planet Cyclops. A project like this begins with a storyboard, a step-by-step -step breakdown of the script. Each sketch, which represents one frame of the sequence, is accompanied by a description of what will be on the soundtrack. The art director makes more detailed drawings of the spaceship, then a designer feeds the computer data about the vehicle's size and shape. The computer translates this information into a graphic model of the spaceship. Now it's possible to make design changes and add details that immediately become visible on the screen. Another designer uses an electronic paint system to create the surface of the planet Cyclops. After figuring out how to describe the spaceship's movements mathematically, animators run a test with wireframe models. Finally, each step of the action is recorded on videotape one frame at a time. Obviously, many hours of work by people and computers went into this short sequence. That's because computer-generated animation is still in its infancy. Tomorrow's technology will make it possible to animate much more quickly, and it will enable artists to create images we can't even imagine today. The way people view those images may be on TV sets quite different from the ones we have now. There's a movement underway to make the quality of the TV picture as good as 35 millimeter film. A number of electronics firms have already developed technology for high definition television or HDTV. A high definition TV picture will have many more lines of pixels than our sets have now. The TV set in your living room has 525 lines. HDTV could have up to 1125. And the dimensions of the screen will be different too. The ratio of the HDTV screen will be 5 by 3 as opposed to 4 by 3. But before HDTV is to become a reality, there must be worldwide agreement on technical standards and a strategy for changing over to the new technology. at various ways technology is changing what's on the small screen. Now to find out what's in store for us on the big screen, we turn to producer Thomas Brown. Thomas earned his reputation as a technical wizard through his work with filmmakers George Lucas and Francis Ford Coppola. Currently, he is developing a feature titled Passing Through Linden, which will be shot in New Jersey. Could you give us a kind of an overview of how these video uh, technological advances are affecting the movie business now? Well, what's, what's actually happening now is that people through, especially through this uh, electronic storyboarding process that we're using, are able to simulate their films before they actually shoot them. And if you're making a, uh, uh, a film, an uh, average film in, in Hollywood these days can cost $10 million, and you find that people are going into these uh, productions with uh, only the director knowing uh, what the vision of the movie is, mm -hmm. and and so if you can simulate this movie so that more of your, your collaborators on the project know what's going on, then uh, the chances of you uh, making the movie that the director wants to make are a little bit greater, mm -hmm. and, and therefore I think the movies will improve. Now, a storyboard is simply sort of taking the strip like this, and little pictures are drawn, and right. they're generally sketches. How does, that, how does an electronic storyboard differ? from a paper storyboard. It's just a, a, an extension of that paper. Uh, you, could, you could take the, uh, the images and lay them all down in sequence onto a video cassette and then see them in, uh, in the sequence that they're supposed to be in rather than, than turning the pages in a book. Uh, mm -hmm. Take the screenplay, for instance, uh, and record actors reading the screenplay and create a radio play by adding music and sound effects and that becomes your soundtrack and the soundtrack is the length of the movie and you lay the uh, the storyboard drawings down onto the videotape uh, in sequence uh, uh, so that you will see the pictures as the sound happens and we're actually now able to do this uh, on a little computer system where that we can uh, work in stages before that we get to video cassette we, we can see the movie in sketch form on on a little apple macintosh computer so this in effect when you get out of the field when you're paying maybe 50 or 60 people right. saves a lot of money when the actual shooting comes well yeah directors like to experiment they they like to try things out mm -hmm. and uh, if you can try these things out ahead of time so that you at least know where some of the dead ends are, uh, then you don't have to try those out with the, the giant crews of people <laughs> and uh, spend all the money that's going to end up on the cutting room floor. 
from the cutting room floor and from the behind the cameras, let's move to the camera itself. Is video ever going to replace motion picture film, do you think, for, for the creation of big screen I, pictures? I agree with those people who say that, that ultimately all images that we see will be electronic images. But I think it will happen in stages. I think that, that uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, video, as far as for motion picture uh, makers, uh, video makes a very good sketch pad uh, to try things out. Mm -hmm. Next, if you start to get into devices which can manipulate, like some of the other uh, devices you've shown in this, this series, of mm -hmm. uh, where that you can take uh, pictures and pull them apart and stretch them and color them differently, uh, magically uh, do things to images, that would be the next step where they could be usable in, uh, in film technology if you can get the, the quality high enough, which there are devices now which, which do that, one mm -hmm. of them, the Pixar by Lucasfilm. The what? The Pixar. What is uh, that? P-I-X-A-R. It's a device that would allow you to shoot, uh, for instance, you could shoot an, uh, on film and then digitize that information and you have it in electrical form, mm -hmm. uh, electronic form. You have it uh, as uh, a different little bits of digital information and you can pull the picture apart, uh, uh, you can uh, massage it on, in all these different uh, very, very magical ways mm -hmm. and then, uh, then write it back onto film because it's going to be shown in theaters on uh, 35 millimeter, 70 millimeter film. So you have to be able to do that and do it transparently. Mm -hmm. Do it in a way that you can't tell it's, it's gone through an electrical stage other than you say, well, gee, there's no other possible way they could have done what I just saw on the screen. Mm -hmm. Hollywood uh, kind of has it. It's a little bit hidebound in some of its traditions. I'm thinking now that, that motion pictures today are shot largely like gone with the wind. I mean, in 50 years of basic technology in terms of cameras and so on hasn't changed all that much. Where are we going with that basic technology and do you see a lot of, of uh, willingness to change in Hollywood now? I see a willingness to change by young directors. I'm working with a, uh, a young woman, Meg Switzcable, who is from New Jersey and she's directing this, this film that I'm producing and uh, she sees these these tools as being a way for her to make a movie that she would have a, a, on the limited money that we have to work on it'd be difficult to make it without the benefit of these tools mm -hmm. i think that any of these tools will be uh, uh, there they seem to be adapted and adopted uh, more easily by uh, young people who don't have a preconception of the way that that things should operate and I'm reminded that the, uh, the film business is based on technology and innovation. In the early days, they always had to create the tools that they were using. And it was only as, um, maybe there's a parallel between the, the uh, stagnation of certain industries in this country, uh, where that as we got towards the end of the Industrial Revolution and we started into the information age, certain uh, uh, technologies which are more closely connected to the Industrial Revolution, which I think the film camera is, mm -hmm. they are in their most advanced stages, whereas electronic technology is in its infancy. So as the electronic technology grows and becomes higher quality, then more and more people will see, well, this is something that I can utilize. But even in its current form right now, it's highly uh, usable by filmmakers as a sketch pad. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the way that we're using it. Thomas Brown, thank you. 20 years ago, you never could have guessed that this program could be taped and watched on your own video cassette recorder. We are in the midst of a technological revolution that is putting special effects on 70 millimeter film and special moments on 8 millimeter videotape. New electronic tools are profoundly influencing the way we see the world around us. At the same time, they are transporting us to places that once only existed in the mind's eye. For Innovation, I'm Jim Hartz.